the FBI and the terrorist who they say was determined to kill right here in America. Convicted killer Jamie Osuna was in court this morning on new charges of beheading his cellmate. Traditionally, cannibalism is a term linked to savage creatures. However, what occurs when this label applies to certain humans? In this video, we'll explore the case of the bloodthirsty vampire of Sacramento and the peculiar tale of the first woman to grace the FBI's 10 most wanted list. These are the individuals the FBI desperately wants us to purge from our memory. Get ready to be astonished by their stories. Vampire of Sacramento, Richard Chase, Richard Trenton Chase, infamously known as the Vampire Killer of Sacramento, left a trail of horror and gloom in his wake. His twisted actions, marked by drinking the blood of his victims and engaging in cannibalism, shocked the world. Six innocent lives fell victim to his gruesome desires. Born on May 23, 1950 in Sacramento, California, Chase displayed disturbing behavior from an early age. Setting fires, torturing animals, and bedwetting were just a few of the troubling signs that foreshadowed his dark path. As he grew older, his drug and alcohol abuse escalated, with marijuana and lysergic acid diethylamide LSD becoming his substances of choice. At the age of 21, Chase found himself living together with his firens, but his erratic behavior drove his roommates away, forcing him to return home briefly. Eventually, his father provided rent for a new place. Isolated and devoid of social connections, Chase's disturbing tendencies turned towards capturing, killing, and consuming animals, often in their raw or blended state. In 1976, Chase injected himself with the blood of a rabbit he had killed, leading to hospitalization for blood poisoning. His blood-smeared face, attributed to shaving accidents, concealed a more sinister truth. He was biting the heads off birds and drinking their blood. Medication brought a temporary respite, and he was released. However, his disturbing actions continued. One time, he was discovered naked and covered in blood in a field near Lake Tahoe, Nevada. The incident was reported, but no significant action was taken. Merely months later, he committed his first known murder, shooting and killing Ambrose Griffin in a drive-by shooting. At this point, Chase remained unidentified as the assailant. His next victim was Terry Wallen, a 22-year-old pregnant woman found disemboweled and drained of blood in her home. Chase had collected her blood in a yogurt cup, intending to consume it. The investigation uncovered additional gruesome incidents, such as the discovery of a disemboweled dog in a nearby burglarized house. The FBI developed a profile pointing directly at Chase, and the search for him intensified. But tragedy struck again. Evelyn Miroth's home became a scene of unspeakable horror when her lifeless body, along with those of her six-year-old son and a family friend, was discovered. Evelyn's 22nd-month-old nephew, Michael Ferreira, was missing, with signs suggesting he too had met a tragic fate. A crucial lead came from a woman who encountered a former high school classmate, Richard Trenton Chase. She noticed his sunken eyes, emaciated frame, and bloodstains on his sweatshirt. The police learned that Chase resided close to the murder locations. After a stakeout, they apprehended him, discovering a gun linking him to the crimes, along with a 12-inch butcher knife, rubber boots, blenders containing blood, and chilling evidence in his refrigerator. A calendar marked with the word today on the dates of the Wallen and Mirath murders further incriminated him. Later, a mummified, decapitated baby, the nephew of Evelyn Mirath, was found in a box outside a vacant lot. The trials began in 1979, and despite pleading not guilty because of insanity, Chase was deemed legally sane at the time of his heinous acts. He was found guilty on all six murder counts. Chase revealed the chilling details of his modus operandi, explaining that locked doors meant he was unwelcome, a sinister admission that sent shivers down the spine. Quincy Allen. Meet Quincy Javan Allen, a name that carries with it a weight of sorrow and despair. His story is one of tragedy and the darkest depths of the human soul. Quincy Javan Allen, an American serial killer, committed a series of murders between July and August during a crime spree in 2002. Many lives were cut short, many dreams shattered by his uncontrolled crime spree. As a result of his crimes, he was convicted and sentenced to death in South Carolina. But what led Quincy down this path of darkness? Testimony revealed that Allen had a history of mental health issues, including oppositional defiant disorder diagnosed in the sixth grade. He had been admitted to psychiatric hospitals multiple times between the ages of 17 and 20, and had attempted suicide while in jail for attempted car theft. On July 10th, 2002, 
During a break from work at Texas Roadhouse Grill, Allen picked up Dale Hall on Two Notch Road, drove her to an isolated cul-de-sac, and shot her three times. He then set her body on fire after dragging it into nearby woods. Allen returned to the crime scene after law enforcement began investigating, pretending to walk a dog on a bridge with a view of the area. On August 8, 2002, Allen got into an argument with two sisters at the same restaurant on Two Notch Road. The confrontation escalated outside, where Allen intended to shoot one of the sisters' boyfriends but instead shot Jedediah Har in the head. Allen later set fire to the boyfriend's home and a co-worker's car from Texas Roadhouse Grill. As if that's not enough, on August 9, 2002, Allen set fire to a stranger's car and then pointed a gun at a patron of a strip club in Columbia. He subsequently left the state and drove to New York City. On his way back south, Allen shot and killed two men in a convenience store in Surrey County, North Carolina. Allen was apprehended in Texas on August 14, 2002. In North Carolina, Allen pleaded guilty to two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of armed robbery, and one count of larceny of an automobile. He received a sentence of life without the possibility of parole. The North Carolina court recognized the convincing evidence of Allen's mental illness and recommended psychiatric evaluation, counseling, and treatment within the Department of Corrections. In South Carolina, a grand jury in Richland County indicted Allen in September 2002 on various charges, including murder, assault and battery with intent to kill arson, and firearm-related offenses. On April 5, 2004, prosecutors filed a notice of intent to seek the death penalty against Allen, and a trial date was set for February 2005. On February 25, 2005, Allen pleaded guilty to all charges and waived his right to a jury trial. The penalty phase of the trial began on March 7, 2005, with expert witness testimony presenting evidence of Allen's troubled childhood and mental illness as mitigating factors. Despite this, Judge Cooper sentenced Allen to death. Currently, he remains on death row, awaiting execution. Jaime Osuna Jaime Osuna, a self-proclaimed Satanist and serial killer, has a dark and disturbing history of multiple crimes. His notorious reputation gained attention in 2011 when he committed a gruesome murder at a motel in Bakersfield, drawing a horrified gaze from the public. The victim, Yvette Pena, was a 36-year-old mother of six who was living in the motel at the time of Osuna's heinous act. The killer, Chami Osuna, was known by chilling aliases such as the sadistic murderer, the real-life joker, or the man with a thousand faces, and he is currently imprisoned in the United States. The main reason he was called the real-life joker was due to the numerous tattoos on his face. He was born on March 7, 1988, and contrary to popular belief, he is not of Mexican descent but was born into an American family in the United States. His upbringing was marked by hardship and violence. As a child, he endured the torment of his stepfather, who allegedly subjected him to torture. At the tender age of five, he would be tied to a tree and whipped by his stepfather, while his uncle once threw a brick at him. These traumatic experiences during his formative years likely played a role in shaping the criminal he would become. The spotlight fell on him in 2011, following the brutal murder of Yvette Pena. It is said that he took pleasure in the thrill of committing the crime and even confessed to it. As a result, he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. While in the custody of the State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, he engaged in unsettling behavior, using blood to write on the walls of his cell. Subsequently, Osuna was transferred to Corcoran State Prison in Kings County. It was there that he became cellmates with 44-year-old Luis Romero. On March 9, 2019, the real-life Joker made national headlines once again, this time for taking the life of his cellmate. The court proceedings for this crime were delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In January 2021, it was determined that Osuna was not mentally fit to stand trial. Medical professionals diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder, unspecified schizophrenia spectrum, post-traumatic stress disorder, and borderline personality disorder. His deteriorating mental state, characterized by increased paranoia and psychosis, was further exacerbated by his refusal to take medication. Presently, Yemi Osuna resides in Kings County Jail, USA, where he is serving his sentence. His crimes and their chilling nature have earned him the label of a self-proclaimed Satanist and serial killer. Freeway Killer William Bonin In the darkest corners of South California, there was a man named William Bonin, whose name would soon become synonymous with terror and heartbreak. Throughout Southern California, 
He was known as the Freeway Killer, a name that instilled fear in the hearts of all who heard it. His horrific crimes shook the region to its core. Between May 1979 and June 1980, Bonin boarded on a spree of unimaginable cruelty. He roamed the intricate roads of SoCal in his worn-out van, searching for victims. It was a chilling game of cat and mouse, with innocent boys and young men falling prey to his sadistic desires. He didn't stop at murder. He subjected them to unspeakable acts of sexual assault and brutal torture. The freeway killer name was earned because he left his victims' bodies discarded alongside major highways and roads. Authorities discovered the remains of his victims and the horrifying truth began to unravel. Before his transformation into the freeway killer and freeway strangler, Bonin had served in the Vietnam War as an aerial gunner. He was even honored with commendation medals for his bravery in saving wounded soldiers. But behind this facade of heroism lurked a dark secret. It was later discovered that he had assaulted soldiers under his command, betraying the trust placed in him. After his discharge from the Air Force, Bonin returned home to live with his mother in Downey. Little did the neighbors know that screams of agony would emanate from his house. He would entice young males with explicit movies and alcohol, preying on their vulnerability. His predatory nature had already landed him in trouble twice before, in 1969 and 1975, for sexually assaulting five boys between the ages of 12 and 18. Despite undergoing psychiatric examinations that deemed him mentally disordered, he was released on parole in 1978. It was then that his descent into darkness accelerated. Working as a truck driver by day, he would prowl the streets and highways in his old van, seeking out his next victims, hitchhikers, schoolboys, and sometimes male prostitutes. He would lure them into his vehicle, overpower them, and bind them with wire cords or handcuffs. The horror that unfolded within that van is beyond comprehension. Bonin would bludgeon his victims mercilessly, using a tire iron as his weapon of choice. His acts of violence were followed by sexual assaults, choking and even stabbing and torturing. Some of his victims met their end through strangulation, their t-shirts becoming the instrument of their demise. Their naked or partially clothed bodies would then be callously discarded along freeways, roads, or behind dumpsters. Throughout his year-long killing spree, Bonin managed to recruit four young men at different times to aid him, as confirmed by the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. In 1982, he received a death sentence for the murders he committed in Los Angeles. The following year, he was handed another death penalty for additional killings in Orange County. On February 23, 1996, at the age of 49, within the confines of San Quentin State Prison, Bonin faced his ultimate fate. Outside the prison walls, pro- and anti-capital punishment activists gathered, their conflicting voices a reflection of society's deep divide. Yet, even in his final moments, Bonin showed no remorse. He declared that the death penalty was not the answer to society's problems, offering misguided advice to potential criminals to ponder their actions. As the lethal injection coursed through his veins, a chapter in our collective nightmares came to a close. However, the wounds he inflicted upon the hearts of his victims' loved ones remain open and raw. The Zodiac Killer the Zodiac Killer, a name that sends shivers down the spine, is the chilling pseudonym of an unidentified serial killer who struck fear into the hearts of Northern California in the late 1960s. Operating in various settings, from rural areas to bustling cities, the Zodiac claimed the lives of five known victims in the San Francisco Bay Area between December 1968 and October 1969. His targets included three young couples and a lone male cab driver. To this day, the case stands as one of the most infamous unsolved murder mysteries in American history, captivating the public's imagination and inspiring countless amateur detectives. The Zodiac's haunting attacks unfolded in locations such as Benicia, Vallejo, unincorporated Napa County, and San Francisco itself. Tragically, five of his victims succumbed to their injuries, while two managed to survive. The killer took pleasure in taunting the authorities and the media, sending a series of menacing messages to regional newspapers. In these letters, he arrogantly threatened to unleash killing sprees and bombings unless his demands were met. Adding a sinister twist, he included cryptograms or ciphers, claiming that his victims would serve as slaves for the afterlife. Despite significant efforts, two of the four ciphers he sent remain unsolved, 
with one being cracked as recently as 2020. The last confirmed letter from the Zodiac arrived in 1974, boasting of an overwhelming 37 victims. Numerous theories have emerged over the years regarding the identity of the Zodiac killer. However, the authorities only publicly named one suspect, Arthur Lee Allen, a former elementary school teacher and convicted sex offender who passed away in 1992. The case's peculiarities and enduring mystery have attracted international attention. In 2004, the San Francisco Police Department declared the case inactive, but reopened it at some point before 2007. The investigations also remain active in the cities of Vallejo, Napa, and Solano counties. Astonishingly, the California Department of Justice has maintained an open case file on the Zodiac murders since 1969, a witness to the enduring intrigue surrounding this enigmatic killer, Ruth Eisenman Shear. The next story is about a woman named Ruth Eisenman Shear, a name that might not ring a bell, but her story is one for the book. Ruth was born in Honduras on November 8, 1942. Her parents were Austrian Jewish refugees who had escaped the horrors of Nazi persecution. Despite the challenges they faced, Ruth pursued an education and graduated from the esteemed National University of Mexico. Her thirst for knowledge led her to the University of Miami's Institute of Marine Science, where she was a graduate student when the incident took place. It was at the college that she crossed paths with a man named Gary Stephen Christ, and little did she know, their meeting would change everything. In 1968, Ruth found herself thrust into the spotlight, becoming the first woman to appear on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. How did this happen? Well, it was a chilling kidnapping plan orchestrated by her boyfriend, Christ. They targeted Barbara Jane Mackle, an heiress from Decatur, Georgia, aiming to collect a ransom. Ruth, unknowingly, became involved in this dark scheme. The world stood shocked at the audacity of their crime. While Christ was swiftly caught, Ruth managed to elude authorities for an astonishing 79 days. A relentless pursuit ensued, with law enforcement determined to bring her to justice. Finally, on March 5, 1969 in Norman, Oklahoma, Ruth Eisman Shear was apprehended, ending her fleeting freedom. She was extradited to Georgia to face trial. Standing before the judge, Ruth mustered the courage to plead guilty, fully acknowledging her actions. The weight of her deeds settled upon her as she received a sentence of seven years in prison. During her time behind bars, Ruth's spirit refused to be broken. It was there that Jean Miller, driven by insatiable curiosity, collaborated with Barbara Jane Mackle herself to recount their harrowing tale in a book called 83 Hours Till Dawn. Their story served as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of adversity. Time marched on and Ruth served her sentence, enduring four challenging years within the confines of prison. In 1973, a glimmer of hope emerged, a chance at redemption. Ruth was granted parole, but with a bittersweet condition. She had to return to her native Honduras, severing the fragile ties she had formed with the land that had witnessed her rise and fall. Her story, though a small part of the larger tapestry of women criminals, found its place in the book Mistresses of Mayhem, a collection that celebrated the extraordinary lives of women who walked the fine line between right and wrong. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. Today's subscriber's pick zooms into the picture of weird-looking Arnie Sanders. But who is the? Well, Arnie had a terrible encounter that turned his life upside down. He bravely shared with his doctor an astonishing tale of angels and demons engaged in a fierce battle on the subway. The doctor was worried for Arnie's well-being, and the doctor decided it was best for him to stay in a mental institution for further examination. Inside those walls, rumors spread among the staff, suggesting that Arnie was truly a strange human with cannibalistic features that sent shockwaves throughout the entire facility. People ran for their dear lives anytime Arnie put up a look showing a vampire dentition. But while Arnie was not charged with any murder or known crime case, other living vampires in human forms have ravaged sacred humanity and made us wonder about the reality of vampires and human vipers. While you enjoy this shocking revelation, don't you think you'll find out more by hooking into the comment section to drop what you think about these and see what others are saying as well? Pablo Escobar Pablo Escobar, known as the King of Cocaine, was a very rich criminal. He had a lot of money, estimated to be around $30 billion when he died. His drug cartel controlled the cocaine trade into the United States during the 1980s and early 1990s. 
He was from Colombia and became famous for being the leader of the Medellin cartel. This was a time of extreme violence, corruption, and wealth. Escobar was born into a family of a farmer father and a schoolteacher mother. They moved to a suburb of Medellin called Envigado when he was a baby. As a teenager, he started doing illegal activities like selling fake diplomas, smuggling stereo equipment, and stealing tombstones to sell. He also stole cars and got arrested for it in 1974. As the cocaine industry grew in Colombia, Escobar got involved in drug smuggling. In the mid-1970s, he helped start the crime organization that later became known as the Medellin Cartel. He was the leader of the organization, focusing on producing, transporting, and selling cocaine. In the 1980s, the Medellin Cartel became very powerful in the cocaine trade. He lived a luxurious lifestyle on a huge estate called Hacienda Napoles in Colombia. It was a 7,000-acre property that cost $63 million. The estate had many extravagant features like a soccer field, dinosaur statues, artificial lakes, a bullfighting arena, an airstrip, and a tennis court. There was also a zoo with giraffes, hippopotamuses, and camels. Escobar also did some charity work to help the poor, which made people compare him to Robin Hood. He even got elected to Congress in 1982. But despite his philanthropy, Escobar was known for being ruthless. He dealt with problems through bribery or violence. He killed rival drug traffickers, government officials, police officers, and innocent people. In 1989, the cartel planted a bomb on a plane to kill an informant resulting in more than 100 deaths. The United States wanted to extradite him, but Escobar didn't want to go to jail there. He preferred to die in Colombia. A massive manhunt was launched to find Escobar, and the government started negotiating his surrender. In June 1991, Escobar surrendered and was put in prison. However, his imprisonment didn't stop his criminal activities or his luxurious lifestyle. He built a fancy prison called La Catedral, which had a nightclub, sauna, waterfall, soccer field, telephones, computers, and fax machines. After he tortured and killed two cartel members there, officials decided to move him to a less comfortable prison. But before the transfer, Escobar escaped in July 1992. The Colombian government, with the help of U.S. officials and rival drug traffickers, hunted him down. On December 1, 1993, Escobar celebrated his 44th birthday. The next day, his hideout in Medellin was found. During a chase and gunfight, Escobar was shot and killed, but some people believe he took his own life. After his death, the Medellin cartel fell apart. Scott Erskine Scudderstein Scott Erskine Scudderstein, a California resident and native, was incarcerated in 1993 after taking the lives of two boys, subsequently landing him on death row. However, he did not live long enough to witness the fulfillment of his sentence as he passed away in 2020 due to COVID-19. There was an outbreak of the virus at San Quentin State Prison where he was serving his time. But even amidst these circumstances, the scariest part of Scott's story lies elsewhere. The real horror began when Scott was just five years old. As a young child, he was struck by a car, resulting in a severe head injury. Scott remained comatose for several days and never fully recovered. He suffered from intense headaches and memory loss. Moreover, his behavior took a dark turn as he started abusing his friends and younger family members from the age of 10. Things only worsened as he reached 15, having been sent to and escaped from a juvenile detention center. Scott went on to commit more violent crimes both inside and outside of prison. His first incarceration occurred in 1980, but shockingly, he was released on parole after only four years. However, in 1993, he brutally attacked a woman, leading to his return to prison. It was only years later that his DNA connected him to the unsolved cases of Jonathan Sellers and Charlie Kiever, who tragically passed away in 1993. Tex Watson Tex Watson was a young man from Texas in 1969 when he got involved with drugs and Charles Manson. He ended up helping to kill seven people. Tex Watson, who was called Charles Watson by his family, was originally a normal kid. He grew up in Farmersville, Texas, which is about an hour northeast of Dallas. He went to church and became a youth group leader. He was a good student, and he excelled in sports like football, basketball, and track. He went to college at North Texas State University before heading to Cal State Los Angeles to finish his degree. However, he dropped out after less than a semester because he wanted to enjoy a fast-paced lifestyle. He got a job selling wigs and helped his friend David Neal get a job at the same store. One night, Tex Watson was driving home when he picked up a hitchhiker. The hitchhiker turned out to be Wilson, 
the drummer for the Beach Boys. Wilson told Watson to take him to his home on Sunset Boulevard in the Pacific Palisades area of Los Angeles. Watson was surprised when he arrived at the house. It was much bigger than his modest home in Texas. He was even more surprised when he was invited inside. Inside the living room, Watson found a man sitting on the floor playing guitar, surrounded by five or six young women. Watson later said that when the man looked up at him, he felt a sense of gentleness, acceptance, and love. Watson was drawn in by the community atmosphere rather than drugs, at least initially. He decided to move in with Manson and his followers at Spawn Ranch, an old movie set, in November 1968. It was at the ranch that Watson earned his nickname because of his Texas accent, which George Spawn, the 80-year-old owner of the ranch, immediately noticed. While living at the ranch, Manson started preaching a strange message. He convinced his followers that he was like a god and that they should obey his every word. In the early hours of August 9th, 1969, Tex Watson and three of Manson's followers, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian, went to the home of Hollywood director Roman Polanski and his wife, actress Sharon Tate. Tate was home with four other people, Abigail Folger, who was heiress to a coffee fortune, Jay Sebring, a hairstylist and Tate's ex-boyfriend, Wojciech Frakowski, Folger's boyfriend and a friend of Polanski's from Poland, and Stephen Parent, a visitor. Atkins later said that Watson woke up Frakowski in the living room and whispered, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. Watson and the others stabbed Tate and her friends many times. Watson had a gun, and he shot Parent four times and Frakowski twice. Before leaving, they wrote the word pig on the front door using the victim's blood. Manson wasn't satisfied with what his followers had done. He thought they needed more practice in killing, so he went with them the next day and oversaw the murder of Leno LaBianca, a grocery store executive, and his wife Rosemary, a businesswoman. Watson was found guilty of seven counts of first-degree murder after a trial where he tried to claim he was insane. However, California abolished the death penalty in 1972, a year after Watson was sentenced to death. Instead of being executed, he was given a life sentence in prison. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.